Have you ever thought about your level of comfort? I mean, in life, really? Like, what exactly would it take for you to honestly say, I'm cool? Is it time? Perhaps more free time to spend with family, friends, doing what you want? What about another or a better partner? Maybe no partner at all. Your secret's safe with me. <laughs> How about a better, more satisfying, more meaningful job? Perhaps knowing you're making a more significant contribution to the world would make you feel more comfortable and content in life. To live comfortably, that is, in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> Let's face it, you need green and I mean lots and lots of money. In fact, according to some very reputable sources, only four other cities in this country will cost you more to make a decent, comfortable life for yourself. Now here are two very interesting things about this quality of life issue though. One, DC perpetually ranks among the top 25 happiest places to live in the country, yet, a, about a quarter of its residents live below the poverty line. We can take two things away from this information. Either a lot of people are getting paid here or folks are focusing on more than just money to make them exhale with a smile. Now politics would lead you to believe that there's a real disparity between these haves and have nots, and maybe there is, but then you meet someone like Desta Maximid, and you too are reminded that satisfaction in life doesn't start or stop with money. Now Desta came to the States from Somalia when she was about 10. Her family was forced to flee their homeland because of ongoing civil war and seek refuge in the US. They settled here in our capital city where they immediately began making a life and a way for themselves, any and every way they knew how. Sure, back in Somalia, her father was a physician and her mother a baker who sold her makings at local markets. But in the U.S. capital city, the doctor became a hospital orderly the guy that assists the staff but doesn't do any actual medical work. And the baker, who had three children of her own, worked here as a nanny for some really happy people living on Capitol Hill. Despite the uphill battle to get on their feet, the humiliation of having to abandon their livelihoods, and the lack of the precise amount of money required in order to be happy in their new town, for obvious reasons, Desta and her family have literally never been happier than they are here. Because for them, happiness is a mindset put in motion by gratitude. Today, Desta is a 23-year-old Howard University student set to graduate next semester with a degree in hospitality management. She works a minimum wage job at a bookstore, cafe, right across the street from the school. But because of her full academic scholarship, she'll transition from student to adult life with a clean slate. In fact, she's already fielding offers from companies that will start her out paying her more than her parents have ever made here in the United States in a calendar year combined. Her dream, though? Oh, she plans to be a small business owner and open up a shop not so different from the one where she works now that helped her through school.
But you see, this story isn't so much about young Desta. She'll be fine. She has the mindset, the tools, and the foundation to go on and do some really great stuff in the world through her chosen field, which she has been well equipped for, partly by her education at the prestigious historically black university where she's spent the last four years, but maybe more so due to the three years she spent working at that independent bookstore, cafe, across the street. It's the kind of place that means more than just what the sign says on the outside. Films, videos, and books. It's a place where you eat. No, you're fed. And not just good food, but history and culture. The location, I'm sure, is no accident. Right across the street from HU, making it somewhat of a supplemental college itself with its literature and events serving as a library of knowledge, it can, with its head held high, say that it invests in its people. Every single patron it invests in. The place, incidentally, is called Sankofa. Now, Sankofa, translated means, it is not taboo to fetch, what is at risk of being left behind. In other words, we should always look back, not to live in the past, but to learn from it. Because to make a slave, you have to take away the culture of a people. See, when we talk about existing in relative comfort, the thing we always overlook is the local businesses. And the thing we fail to even consider when we talk about the change in demographics in historically minority neighborhoods, much like the one Howard University sits in, are these small institutions that are just as integral to the fabric, the aroma, and the taste of the city as the borrowed Egyptian architecture that lined the asphalts. While the nation's capital is busy making all of its new residents so green with happiness, it's the ones who've been here the longest that are left gray and confused, trying to figure out how they're going to stay. Because happy people equals happy money, right? And all that money translates into accommodations to now keep these folks happy. Remember we talked about that influx of places to do yoga? Well, while yoga is making or keeping people happy, cities like D.C., all they see is opportunities. Opportunities to capitalize on your and my presence. This means that the dirt your house sits on suddenly becomes worth more. This also goes for the same dirt a little bookstore cafe sits on. They want more if you want to live here. And they want more if you want to sell here. That is, of course, unless you're a fancy developer or a rich tech company who, in order to seduce them into doing business here, the city will throw money at them in the form of incentives and tax breaks. But this, remember, is to make you feel happy. It's like the anti-Robin Hood, though. Give to the rich, take from the people who really need it. If you're like me, no. This doesn't make you feel very happy right now. In 2019, we almost lost Sankofa to taxes. The very ones that any store with the word Mart in its name would get a break on without even trying. It took protesting, letter writing, and let's be honest, tears were required. But Sankofa did finally win its bid for tax abatement, which means that it's protected for at least the foreseeable future. And I should say that if you do plan to visit Washington, D.C. for any reason at all, make a stop at Sankofa, as the smoothies alone are worth the trip. So Sankofa is safe, but for every Sankofa, there are countless other small businesses, namely small black businesses, that are forced to fold, leaving room for something bigger that might be more appealing 
to the many happy people who live here now. Again, though, to make a slave, you have to first take away the culture of a people. What might become of us if the Sankofas of our neighborhoods are lost to people who believe they'll be happier in the presence of big machines with no history and no culture? Perhaps hope lies in the young people like the Destas of the world. I'm Kayana Ebony Brown, and this is a story of music and men. and five and that is the fifth show I failed to get Lucas on at that place I said defeated about a half an hour after leaving 930 club after getting so close and being shot down I found myself sitting in a window seat in Sankofa's a cafe with an African diaspora centered theme sipping a smoothie Brandon Stakovsky, who I've called Stax ever since we were about 12, because he always knew how to make money, even then, was sitting across from me, wearing a well-tailored suit in that end-of-the-day kind of way, also sipping a smoothie. Well, he said, and looked over at me. The answer wasn't exactly no this time. You just didn't get the right person. And I actually think that he believed that this made it all better because he smiled. So I responded, full of cynicism at this point. Yeah, didn't get the right person to tell me no this time. Stax didn't respond, just continued to focus on his drink because he wasn't bothered by the reality that the show was just a couple days away and that I was no closer to getting Lucas on that stage than I was a year ago. All that mattered to him was that there was still a couple more days until the show. Stax is cool in that Brad Pitt, Tyler Durden fight club kind of way. With his dark hair and olive skin, he could pass for Italian. I never knew what his actual ethnic makeup consisted of, but I knew that he checked the white box on applications. We've known each other ever since we were kids, so... He was used to not always looking like everyone else whenever he went places with me that specifically catered to my culture. But with his devil-may-care attitude and the sheer comfort he had in his own skin, he actually embraced such rare experiences of feeling like a minority. Oh, yeah, (laughs) your boy Dante is expecting payment from you, too. You know for all the work he put in to get me in that club today. (laughs) That was sarcasm. Man, I'm not giving him shit. He owes me. Man, how the fuck you borrow money to give out at a strip club? He said, remembering something that had absolutely nothing to do with this. Shit, his intel wasn't even worth it. He added back on track. And then it hit him. Fuck, I bet it's a promoter we need. We just need to figure out who. Good thing is... Tomorrow's only Friday. A whole new set of 24 hours to try something else. I'm going to get the Spike Lee, he exclaimed out of nowhere, having finally decided on what he wanted to order. The Spike Lee was the name of a sandwich. Stax made his living as an investment consultant for some fancy firm downtown. And he was actually my oldest friend. The only friend who has known me almost my entire life. We grew up as neighbors, just doors apart. So even to this day, he invested in many of my problems as if he had some personal stake in the outcome. I've become used to his use of the term we when referring to solving them. 
At that moment, a Somali girl, who I assumed was probably a Howard University student, given that we were directly across the street from the school, approached the table with a smile and offered to take our order. The smoothie was enough for me at the moment, but I watched as the girl, who wasn't just a waitress but a cashier pulling double duty, smiled and blushed, perhaps taken aback by the forwardness of the only non-black guy in the place at the time, or the fact that he was sitting there with me while still hitting on her. He read her name tag, Desta, and proceeded to call her by her name as if they had known each other for years. Even though we'd only ever been, and only ever will be, just friends, we always debated about whether it was rude of him to leave me hanging during his pursuits, which happened every single time we were out. As Desta walked away, his eyes followed her, examining her backside as if he was trying to lock it into his memory bank, all while concurrently saying, I think I should quit my job. And only then did he look at me, waiting for a response. All I could do was raise my eyebrows, shocked by this admission. He was good at his job, and as far as I knew, he loved it. Or at least he loved the money that it brought him. Either way, I wasn't expecting to hear those thoughts. He went on. You know that girl I told you I started seeing a few weeks ago? She's opening a dance school. She fucking loves dance. She's been dancing her entire life. She can't live without dance. She has all this shit laid out, like she's got a vision and a plan. Like you. You. You have your shit together. Yet, I'm sitting here with you, I reminded him, contemplating my next move. Shit, all I have is a job. No move. He had a point. And who was I to talk somebody into staying somewhere they obviously didn't want to be? I hate to say that I dropped out because it makes me feel like a quitter, but I left college after just one year because I just didn't feel like it was offering me anything I really needed to pay for. But also, knowing my friend almost his entire life meant that I knew how much thought he put into each move he made. Since life was a game to him, he always thought two steps ahead. His fearless, careless attitude had boundaries, so he'd only quit the job he had if his next moves were already lined up. I said anyway, quit the job. There, that's that's your move. Stax stared into his drink silent, probably thinking about the subsequent things that would happen if he took my advice. I don't know whether he liked what he saw during his daydream or not, but after about 10 seconds, he was back. Night's fucking young. What's on your agenda? Well, The Hours is on Netflix. You know, the one with Meryl Streep. I said, watching his eyes glaze over with no recollection of that film. Maybe I'll go home, make some popcorn. And you know, I ever tell you I am a huge Meryl Streep fan? With a grimace, he replied, You know what? Knit a fucking blanket too while you're at it. Jeez, I'm saying it's early. Why don't we go to a bar or something? What about your little dancer friend? I reminded. Knowing he didn't need to, he looked at me and said anyway, Come on, Kay. You know what that is. And I smiled because he was right. I did know. The extent of his relationship with the dancer would likely not develop past the confines of physical intimacy. So, as I always did, I tossed out another question just to give him something else to think about. Well, what about your future wife? You're probably not going to meet her in some bar, my friend. I watched his eyes move to something or someone behind me. I didn't have to turn around to know that it was probably that waitress again. I also didn't have to turn around to see that she was likely smiling back at him, given the naivete that consumed her when she took his order. I'm not looking for a wife tonight. 
Stax is what I would call a fair weather bachelor. Monday through Thursday, he'd go on and on about his plan to someday have a wife. But in the heat of the weekend, <laughs> no recollection of that sentiment whatsoever. No point in exhausting yourself over something you may never have. And his eyes went back down into the smoothie as he aimlessly circled his straw around in it. And just like that, even a challenge-seeking optimist could begin to lose hope under the bleak overcast that is DC's love scene. For others, giving up isn't quite as easy. That night, Jay's Magazine was hosting a networking event at a lounge downtown. And although she had talked Ty into coming with her, she herself didn't actually believe it would happen. But to her surprise, at 8.33 p.m., Ty was right beside her, both head-turning in their evening attire as they entered the room filled with other equally nicely dressed professionals. Jay noticed from the moment she met her at the front door, Ty was very uncomfortable, fidgeting and looking down, and had already asked twice, though they hadn't even gotten their first drink yet, do I look okay? To which Jay replied, twice, you look great. But the third time she added, would you calm the fuck down? Shit, it's not that serious. Ty tried to take her advice by first avoiding looking down at her dress, and second, asking something that had nothing to do with the way she looked. <sighs> so, what is this again? It's a professional social, Jay replied. Just you network or flirt, whatever. Ty noticed Jay's eyes scanning the place, and she remembered that Jay was looking for someone in particular. So she asked, So, what does this guy look like again? Oh, he's cute. He's tall, lean, kind of looks like a young Chris Rock. Ty grimaced. Chris Rock? You think Chris Rock is good looking? Really? I mean, yeah, when he's not acting so goddamn goofy, he's kind of sexy, Jay said matter-of-factly. I don't think he's acting. Look, next time you see him on TV, mute it. If you don't hear his goofy-ass mouth, you might see him differently. Ty made up in her mind that they just have to agree to disagree on this. Just then, Ty spotted two men approaching. The tall, lean one was Carl. She could tell that he was the guy Jay was just talking about because he did, in fact, look just like Jay described. Carl smiled as he wrapped one arm around Jay and brought her in for a quick kiss on the cheek. Wow, you look amazing, he said to Jay, who instantly turned into a girly girl as she giggled and blushed with the compliment. And then he wasted no time introducing the guy with him, who was much shorter, a little lighter in complexion, and to Ty's surprise, incredibly attractive to her. But this wasn't exactly a good thing. Perhaps, had she not been so attracted to him, maybe she wouldn't have immediately become so hot and shaky and sweaty. This is Ahmad, my good friend from back home in St. Louis. He followed me here after college, calls himself an African studies professor. How about that? Ty was born in Nigeria, Jay chimed in. Oh yeah? Ahmad said, intrigued. I just came back from there a couple months ago. Where exactly in Nigeria are you from? Now Ty was nervous for another reason. She knew that this was a perfect conversation starter and that she should feel comfortable beginning here with him. But where exactly she was from wasn't a talking point that she preferred to hit this early in an acquaintance. The reason was because it usually drew one of two reactions. Either they were unfamiliar, which then was a pointless use of conversation, or it caused eyebrows to raise because they were, in fact, familiar with the affluent reputation of her part of her hometown, which then triggered a change in behavior, whether consciously or unconsciously. 
Uh, Lagos, she answered, hoping he didn't want to get any more specific than that. Even though if he did, she'd understand. Lagos was the largest city in the country. It would be like telling someone that you were from New York. Naturally, they might want to know which borough specifically. Okay, he said, sounding inexplicably impressed by this. Yeah, I visited Lagos, but only briefly since I was touring a few countries. He smiled and added, I look forward to talking to you some more about this. She attempted to smile, but knew that she had failed. Meanwhile, Carl was talking closely into Jay's ear, probably something about how good she looked, because she was giving that laugh again. Ty found herself becoming a bit annoyed now by how comfortable Jay was, especially in contrast to her own discomfort level at this point. You look really nice, Ahmad offered in an attempt to cut the quiet between the two of them. And I'm feeling that haircut. It really it brings out your face. Looks, looks real good on you. Ty simply looked at him right in his eyes, which made him uncomfortable now. Now he was the one getting all warm and fidgety. I think we should get ourselves some drinks. Jay's date suggested. Yes, drinks, Ahmad quickly agreed. Just as Jay was set to follow them to the bar, Ty took her arm, stopping her. <sighs> Listen, look, I, I can't do this. I'm, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Jay wasn't angry. She got it. In fact, she might have even been expecting this. Ty went on explaining anyway. It's just this whole thing, the, the talking to people, the men, and I just, I can't be here. To that, Jay replied, you want me to come with you? Ty was taken aback by that gesture. She knew Jay loved her, but she had never, not once in her 10 or so years that they had known each other, ever known Jay to choose another entree if there was the slightest chance that sex would be on the menu. Ty had seen the way she and that Carl guy were already all over each other, so to offer to leave and accompany her back to an empty old apartment was not only nice, it was admirable. Or maybe she was just being nice and admirable because she knew that Ty would say exactly what she said, which was, no, no, you stay. It's me. I'm, I'm sorry, okay? I just, you have a good time. I'll just, I'll catch a ride home. Jay nodded and that was that. She watched as Ty took off and out the door they had just come in. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. What we think, we become. Of course, I had to pause the movie to write that down. My evening was being spent very much like I thought, with popcorn and Meryl Streep, though I opted for the Iron Lady over the hours. When the phone rang midway through the second act of the film, it was Ty. Hey, I answered. I could tell she was pacing. She probably phoned me no sooner than she got in and closed the door behind her. She hated talking on the phone while in public. Kenya. I, could, I couldn't do it. I left. And oh, I feel so bad leaving Jay there. I didn't know what to say. My friend had been trying for weeks now to get back to normal, but I could tell that this was going to be a familiar conversation. Ty had not found a way to return to normal yet. She had been in one relationship for the better part of her adult life. She had given this one person everything, every part of her. All of her time, all of her attention, all of her. 
she was building a life, and it was supposed to be with him forever. But now, all of that had changed. The betrayal, the deceit, the pain. It all felt like it was her fault for either allowing it or choosing this guy as her forever in the first place. Ah, she'll be fine, I said regarding Jay. And you are just not ready yet. And that's okay. There was silence. Since I was five years old, my hair has always been the first thing anybody noticed about me. It was the source of every compliment I ever got from men and from women. It was the thing, even he told me, that initially attracted him to me, so... I could tell that she was holding back tears as she thought about her soon-to-be ex-husband. I guess now that it's gone, all that's left is me. And that has to be enough. Pretty enough, attractive enough, good enough. Enough, you know? Her question was rhetorical. I even let the silence enter so that she could think about the answer to that herself. And then I offered. I mean, if it means anything, I personally like the Lupita look. I think it's working for you. (laughs) But, I mean, you're gorgeous either way. I smiled. And I could tell that this made her smile too. Thank you. Kenya, oh, I did not plan for this. You think I'll ever recover? And that's another thing about love in a place like D.C. When it's gone, it'll make you feel like it took everything you had with it. But if it was never there, well, then you never have to feel the violation of being robbed. This was the advantage had by those like Jay. Who, by the way, did go home with that Chris Rock-looking dude and did have incredible, meaningless sex. And other than the pleasure felt that night, on multiple occasions, as she later informed me, she would not feel anything. No pain, no betrayal, no deceit, no regrets. So I thought about Ty's question to me, if I thought she would ever recover. And I responded, of course you'll recover. And you'll be even better than the you with the good hair. She caught the Beyonce reference and found humor in it, as well as relief. For some reason, she believed me, even though I had no experience whatsoever that would validate my wise words to her about overcoming a failed marriage. You just need time, I went on like I knew what I was talking about. Look, tomorrow's a new day. Start over. You get a fresh set of 24 to maybe try something new. This episode of Of Music and Men was written and produced by me, Kayana, with express permission and the help of some of the most incredible indie artists in the world. Now we closed out the episode with a track from Mona Wanderlich and as a bonus, it's a free download for this episode. Just go to our website at ofmusicandmen.com and you can find information on how you can get it. We also had music from Mikhail Manvalen, the track called Virgo. 
The rest of the music for this episode was provided by Filmstro, arranged and designed for this episode by yours truly. Music for your word of inspiration is by Scott Buckley. For more information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to ofmusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. Now, if you would like to have your music featured on this show, check out our website for more information on how you can submit. Now, Music and Men, as you know by now, is so much more than just a podcast. The novella series is available in online bookstores, and if you wish to have a physical copy of that, you can get it on our website right now at ofmusicandmen.com, where you can also get t-shirts and other cool merch. Don't forget to subscribe. I gotta say it again. Please do not forget to subscribe at Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever it is that you're listening to podcasts or you prefer to listen to podcasts. And remember to rate and review. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love it if you just gave me a five-star rating. I mean, that would be totally incredible and cool. And um, lastly, but of course not leastly, (laughs) connect with us on Patreon, where you can become a part of this project and its journey. And I can't stress how important that is. We have two levels, which is the two and the five. You can be a two or you can be a five. All that means is you can come in at the $2 level or you can come in at the $5 level. And what that means, again, is that every time I release an episode, you can support for two bucks or five bucks. Now, of course, I mean, I'm not going to stop you if you trying to give more. That would only be more helpful and help this thing to grow even more. But, you know, two and five, I think is fair. And um, it's pretty affordable for most people listening to podcasts. But you get a lot of benefits for being a patron. It's not like you're just giving out money and getting the same thing that people for free would get it. But if you go to Patreon, our our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash of music and men, you can see the benefits of coming in at two bucks and you'll get even more benefits by coming in at five. Uh, And like I said, it'll help us grow to everything that we were meant to be. Make sure that you share this. That's probably the actual last thing, not the most least thing. But the last thing is to make sure you share this in some way, somehow, with at least one of your friends. And follow Of Music and Men everywhere online at Of Music and Men. And when you do, please do not hesitate to reach out. Artists and entrepreneurs are a very unique type. We face lots of rejection, almost too often for comfort. So whether you're a seasoned business owner or creator, aspiring to be one, or you're simply just here to hear a great story, I want to always leave you with something to ponder until next time. Today's words are from Thomas Edward Patrick Brady, quarterback for the multiple Super Bowl winning New England Patriots. I believe that the more you care for people, the more you love people, the more you find joy in your life, the better our society is, the better our communities are, the better our teams are, the better our families are. That sounds like a lot to think about, but really it's not. All it's saying is, as long as you continue to have an open heart, Life will always reward you. How are you making your life and everyone in it and around you better by maintaining an open heart? Next time on Of Music and Men. Just then... A young woman quickly came through the door that separated the lobby from the important part of the station and breezed by us straight toward the entry door. It was her. Her. She's the one who let me in and told me to sit here, TK informed. Um, excuse me. But she was already opening the entry door and the noise coming from the people she was letting in drowned out my voice. I heard her tell the group. Hi, I'm Christina, the production assistant. Let me show you to the studio. I counted seven guys and one girl. And then I recognized the guy in the middle of the pack. 
Wale, a major label artist from D.C. who had sold millions of records, sold out countless shows, and had obviously been here a number of times before because he led the group right past us and through the double doors to the studio. I didn't manage more than an excuse me before the intern and the group was out of sight. But before pessimism could set in, I was in luck. Amelia, that vegan host who I had made the agreement with, came through the doors headed in another direction. She didn't even see us. Hey, I yelled and then went to track her down. Off guard, she turned and said, Oh, hey, it's you. That's next time on Of Music and Men.